How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. You might not know this, but before I record an episode, I like to break a sweat. And I do that using the Chop Fit. Over the course of the past year, the Chop Fit has allowed me to lose weight, tone up my body, and feel even more amazing about myself. A feeling that you should all feel about yourselves as well. If you use this code, SpearChop10, you get $10 off your order. Once again, use code SpearChop10 for $10 off your Chop Fit order. It'll change your life. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? Uh, John here, the host of Spear Talk. And today, uh, we have the honor and privilege to welcome the incredible William Sanderson. Uh, foremost, one of my favorite actors, but maybe wrote one of the, my favorite autobiographies called Yes, I'm That Guy, The Rough and Tumble Life of the Character Actor. And I had read, reached out to William, yourself, um, because I wanted to talk about your career, because um, I just really went back and watched the latest, the last Deadwood movie. And I'm like, man, this guy has such a fascinating life. So in my basic research, I do about the army, uh, you're serving in the army. Um, but then I'm like, well, William wrote a book. And so literally the day after I reached out and you responded, I go, I got to read this book because there's stuff in here and I want to talk about it that kind of blew me away. So to have you here today, William, is an honor and a privilege. Well, as I said before we started, the honor is mine. And uh, so I, and I know you're kind of out of uh, retire from Hollywood. And I know the last year um, has been crazy with the pandemic. But what have you kind of done to kind of stay sane through uh, this whole craziness? Well, that's a great question. I, uh, I had football to watch and I don't have that now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had uh, slowed down in the acting. I thought this would be great. I can promote and uh, somebody will come up to me and say, are you working? And I'll say, yeah, I'm promoting a book. But, uh, so I'm very grateful to you. We couldn't do much promoting in, uh, uh, during the pandemic. It was it uh, P.T. Barnum said, uh, without promotion, something bad happens. Right. Nothing. But to answer your question, uh, not a lot. I, I'm uh, the dog walker now. Uh, my mother-in-law passed away. Bless her heart. And Sorry about that. Uh, I got a promotion. I'm the dog walker. That's good. Uh, dog's best friend right there. And so you actually moved to Pennsylvania, which... Uh, I, my family's my mom's side of the family's up in Western New York and the Albany, that type of region. So I, I love that part of the country. And having traveled the world like yourself, uh, I find the quiet places are some of the best places in the world to kind of reset and get away from all the badness and media and news and all that. And so when you got to Pennsylvania, was that your goal to kind of get away and retire peacefully and just kind of live the rest of your life that way? Well, I never saw myself, uh, walking away from acting, but I love my wife and she wanted to be close to her family and help them out. Uh, and she did and uh, made them more comfortable. Her grandfather made it to a hundred and I was oh, happy wow. to be part of it. Uh, but it took a little getting used to, but as you know, these people are very real here. So I love that. I love the people. Um, I go to the American Legion, and I, uh, it's, uh, it's quite different from Hollywood, but Hollywood has changed so much, and I'm not sure I'm woke enough, you know, for <laughs> Hollywood. Now, uh, we're, not talk we're not talking about politics, excuse me. Right. No, it's all good. And uh, so with your book, which I suggest everyone needs to read, uh, even if you're not a fan of, say, your – the act Hollywood or stuff like that, just to, your story is so mesmerizing. And when you put this book together, is the preparation similar or different to the, what you put a role together for a movie or a TV show? Well, I started out just uh, typing and putting, putting, telling, just putting it down in a sloppy style, I guess. Uh, it was actually a word processor I was using. And uh, uh, I soon learned I'd need somebody to help me organize it. So I asked a uh, man in Hollywood to do that. And my wife was a big help. I used to, as the book says, drink too much. And uh, I made a 
packed with God. You helped me get through this book. I stopped drinking. Yep. And <clears throat> excuse me, I did. I'm uh, still, uh, you know, but uh, I don't know if I'm answering. They, they, do I approach it like the, the roles? Probably. Uh, just uh, I had to go back the sections when I was a kid and stalking, following Elvis. I'd had to go back and get dates and things. But right. I'd say, uh, yeah, probably the only way I know how. Just no, do I got instinctively, you. instinctively. But you, if you've written a book, you know more about it than I do. Because <laughs> I was, I was happy that it got great reviews on Instagram. I mean, on uh, uh, Amazon. Yep. And it's very hard not to brag on a book, but uh, now they are. One of the reviews are there. One of the interesting things, and I had no idea your whole quest to meet Elvis and your relationship with Elvis. And you tell a story there about the bumper cars and you brought almost like this human, like, uh, I think when people look at Elvis, they kind of look at him as like this holy, like this godlike figure, this mythical creature that you actually, your quest for him made him more human. And it's very fascinating that growing up in Memphis, and one of our good followers, Lori, actually asked a really good question. Um, like, you're growing up in Memphis with Elvis and stuff like that. Did that kind of dictate uh, or change your kind of trajectory you wanted for yourself to kind of chase someone like Elvis? Well, this is a good question. I didn't know it at the time. I just started like, <clears throat> excuse me, in fifth grade listening to him on the radio. That's all right, Mama. And then got to see him in a concert. I was 11 years old and uh, as I say in that book, I got to go in his house, but I really just followed him around. In high school, I got to play football with him. And uh, But he, when I was only 12 or 13 years old, he became the highest paid entertainer in the world. And he was just a big inspiration. But I didn't know that it would be that way later, like I'd go in the Army when nobody expected me to. And, right. Uh, but he was always extremely friendly to the fans, luckily, because I did some dumb things, including <laughs> climbing the fence with my buddy who dared me and they kicked me out. But uh, I don't know, it, it's, uh, I don't even know how to talk about him, except he, uh, he inspired a lot of people. Uh, Keith Richards said he sparked a dream, but that happened after I got out of school, felt, felt uh, sort of fell in love with that acting. Right. And I, I'd look back at those experiences. Well, wait, he did this. He, he was broke and he lived in a housing project. Poor, one of the poorest schools in Memphis. Right. He went to Hollywood and maybe made a movie. They had given him a um, Goodwill basket at Christmas. Well, the next year he came back and gave them $50,000. <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. <laughs> One of the cool things about your chapter here about Elvis and everything is you talk about the nuances you were studying him, how he dealt with people, how he talked to people, how he moved. Is that something that kind of you kind of started to get in your head? Uh, eventually, he's become a character actor. Have you in, developed these skills? Is it watching people? Is that one of your things where you kind of figure out how to really get into a character? Um. If nothing else, I guess I was one that stood at, stood in the back and watched him a lot. And he'd get out of his, uh, he'd rent the theater at midnight uh, and bring his friends in. And I could drop the right name, I could get in, but he uh, got out of a Winnebago and his buddies got out and somebody asked him for an autograph. And he, he always talked like he'd been in the service. Thank you, sir. Nice meeting you, sir. Yep. That stuck with me, but, and I got his autograph and some woman who does nothing but this is worth a lot of money, <laughs> but uh, I'm not selling it. Gosh, my stories get so long. Good John. No, it's, uh, it's awesome. And you, I'm glad you bring up the, uh, your military service. When you're in the military, the army, are you thinking what's ahead after that? Like when you're, you're in the middle of your service, what is your thinking as you're getting ready to transition out? Is it jumping into acting? Is it, what are you exactly aiming to do with your life after that? 
Well, when I went in the army, nobody from my high school did. They they were it's a real good public school and they went to college. And I knew I wanted to go to college, but I just impulsively volunteered for the draft at 18. I didn't want the, three years. I would have thought I'd forget what little I learned in high school. So I only did two years active, two years reserve uh, active and then two inactive. But uh, I guess I was a little scared right. <laughs> going to the Army. You know, you know, the sergeant says, who can whip anybody here? <laughs> When we came off the bus, so I didn't raise my hand. Yeah, <laughs> I'm five eight and nervous. That uh, a big black gentleman raised his hand, and uh, we got along fine. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't answer your question. I'm uh, the army, but it gave me the GI Bill to get yep. all the way through law school without taking the bar exam which someone would say is axiomatic. I should ask you about your background in the military. I believe your company, wasn't he a decorated war veteran? Yeah, he was a uh, decorated uh, military uh, Marine, uh, Marine Corps and uh, disabled. And uh, wow. that's kind of why we um, started this company. He's, once he that's got great. out, he, uh, the story about Chris, the CEO, is that he was he grew up in the Frank Zappa household, was Gail and Frank Zappa. And so when he got out, he basically got brought in with the family, kind of lived with them and stuff out in California. And that was some of his first clients, is this, the Zappa estate. So that's how we kind of led into from military uh to this private security field. Cause someone like Frank Zappa was like, Hey, I need the I'll help the veterans, I'll help the military. And then kind of one thing led to another. And yeah, it's just a very I love seeing veterans and stuff and whatever we could do. We work with the Department of Defense and Skillbridge program to help military men and women transition into the civilian world. And I think that's something that's very vital in today's day and age. Oh, um, yeah. and I think I, I, I get so sad when you see veterans or military people, Vietnam vets, all these guys and girls that are on, hooked on drugs or homeless. And I wish there was more we could do about it. So whatever small part we can do helping them with uh, getting licenses and schooling and stuff like that. We're going to be proud to do so. But for you, thank you for your service. Well, uh, thank all of you. And uh, I read how the guy who started with his name escapes me, but uh, was had a distinguished career. And I yes. often say mine was undistinguished, but I stayed out <laughs> of trouble the whole time. I worked at it. And uh, in retrospect, love the discipline, but only if they would read the book, they'll see where I got in trouble. Right. Uh, there's Air Force Base, ironically. But I, I'd always looked up to the FBI. Until that time, I lost a little respect because everybody that stopped me in this instant on, <laughs> on the Air Force Base. I didn't love believe that story. Me. You're lying. I love that story. You're lying. <laughs> the FBI guy. Takes my money, yep. buys a ticket. It got me most of the way home to Tennessee, and I had to hitchhike. But anyway, I hope they read this story. No, and I, again, whatever we could do to get people to read this, because it's super fascinating. And so how I do about you, uh, growing up a Blade Runner, Rocketeer, uh, all these different roles, Deadwood, True Blood. Um, but I've always struggled with, I always thought when people refer to themselves as a character actor, that they're kind of, uh not so i guess my i guess the question for you is what's the difference between a, an actor and a character actor in the simplest form boy that's a that's a great question but i say that character actors are the ones that won't win any beauty contest generally. okay okay and um the obvious uh but I have loved being a character actor and meeting all the A-list actors in, in the world. Uh, I mean, that I did, and it carried me around the world. So uh, I heard you say that you'd been around. So I didn't know if your work carried you or you traveled. But I travel. I, I work. To go to these places had I not been an actor. Right. So, you know, I travel the world for security, doing security for celebrities, bands and stuff. And uh it's, uh, I guess, a perk of the job, but just like any day, it's, you can have really bad days and uh, just how you, how you process those bad days and move forward, I think is uh, what's super important. I'm sorry. I have to, I think, blow my nose more. We thought it was snowing here in Pennsylvania, but I, I can't tell if it was leaves, but my nose no, keeps... No, 
It's snow flurry, my wife. This said. weather is but, but ridiculous. But about you and your security, you know, it, it fascinates me. And uh, did you study martial arts too? Um, I went to a military college, did Navy ROTC for four years. And then from there, I did uh, six and a half, seven years in the Secret Service uh, with Obama. And then, uh, wow. so th through the training, a lot of the Secret Service training was like Krav Maga, like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu type stuff. Um, where it's kind of, and I know in your book you talk about, which I had no idea, your love of martial arts and why you wanted to go see some fights. Uh, but the, it, it, I'm just kind of blown away um, that I could do this type of podcast and learn to talk to people who I might not have the time to get a black belt or put the time to be a martial artist or whatever, but I can at least talk to these people that have the experience. Or I've never served in the military, but I can talk to people that have and hear their stories and share their stories. So that's kind of why I did all this. Well, I, it's like dropping a name. I was undistinguished. My brother put two uh, tours in in Vietnam. And uh, so enough for that. I, I Can I show them my shirt? Yeah, Dave? 100%. I'm that guy. I love it's it. It's the name of the book. Did you see it? Could you see it? Yeah, no, it's great. I. Uh, it and, uh, anyway, I'm, uh, that's a character actor. They, they'll say, Who? oh, that guy was on the New Heart show. Oh, that guy. <laughs> or, and, and then, you know, that weirdo that was in Blade Runner. That guy. So that's uh, the literary agent picked uh, the uh, subtitle of uh, and I think it fits. What no, it's it's and one of the cool things. Like when you do a movie like Death Hunt with Lee Marvin, Charles Bronson, or Lonesome Dove, and all this this wide. It's just for every reason. I don't know if I'm drawn to character actors because well, the reason you said it because they're the people that are the nitty gritty with the crazy makeup, or the people that make these stars like really shine. And I guess when you work with someone like Tommy Lee Jones or think of all these other A-listers you've worked with and made their movies that much better. Do they have a sense of ship on the shoulder because they know you're that good? Or do they respect the fact that we need someone like you here because you bring gravity to this, this movie or TV show? Oh, they're like all of them. Uh, <laughs> some, if they get what they want, they're right. very happy. But the trick is to try to be good in your moment, but don't upstage the stars uh, Tommy uh, we may have a uh, Tommy Lee you mentioned I yep. have a love hate relationship but he <laughs> I did six projects with him and yes. they asked me to do a seventh with Batman and Val Kilmer pardon me for dropping names again but I I couldn't do it because a famous director wouldn't let me out of the rehearsals and <laughs> I got another movie at the same time but Tommy uh, very bright great actor and uh, I learned from him, uh, but like a bit, Chevy Chase is a different kind of person than James Garner was. James Garner was kind and he took time. I uh, was pretty new on the West Coast he, he, to why you have to do what you do. Right. Uh, the, the same thing when they reversed the camera and uh, Chuck Norris was, uh, Great to me, put me in several projects. Yep. He off, they wrote a role for me, and then uh, I couldn't do it. And uh, Emmett Walsh did it, and it made it was the highest grossing independent film, missing in action. That, if I can interject, somebody yes. says, What's your book about? It's about my successes and disappointments, often being a danger to myself. Right. And then I wrote, I uh, talked to these people at a book. Uh, club in uh, West Virginia, and I said, the drinking, the arrest, the self-sabotage, uh, the self-doubt, uh, and on and on, but somehow continuing to get these jobs in Hollywood, and a lot of jobs. Thank God. Now, and it's you, all met, <laughs> you mentioned Chevy Chase. And I, I think Fletch is a top five comedy, and so when it, and you've obviously have this incredible career in science fiction, uh, horror, uh, westerns, time pieces is there a is it tough or does a depending on if you say it's a comedy or a, a western or a vampire show when you have to become a character is there a certain genre that's easier for you to become get immersed in that character or are they all kind of blend together it's just on you to kind of make that character live in this world uh 
uh, some of my peers might say, oh, he does the same thing every time. But on my website, it says disturbed guy, <laughs> Western guy, uh, sci-fi guy. And it goes on to several. And some nerd groups have picked me as one of the top 10 nerds. And that's a great compliment. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't think I answered you, which is a bad habit. Uh, no, you're... it's hard. It's hard to talk about my book and not sound like I'm bragging. And I, I just thank you very much for no, you have reading. to. Uh, that's that's why you're here to uh, talk about your book and your career. Uh, what's fast? So, I, to follow up on the the uh, the character acting, when you do a TV show, whether it's New Heart or True Blood or Deadwood that character has to be created every episode for a duration of years. Is that harder for you to kind of jump back into that, in and out of that character as opposed to say uh, Skeets from Rocketeer where it's just a one movie based on you. How does that, how do you differentiate between that? Well, it helps if you've done the theater, which a lot of um, right. my friends did. And the more theater you do, the better, you can be. I happen to have played the town crazy a number of times back in New York in the 70s. And so <clears throat> I transferred when I went to see the people at Newhart, I just kind of did something that I'd done in different projects. I put a yep. quarter in my ear <laughs> because I'd seen uh, people do that down south. Nobody knew it was in there. I did it for good luck. But or, uh, oh, I, I, watched, I watched a lot of bums on the Bowery in New York, and it looked like he's picking lint off his hair. I don't know what he was doing, but I did things right. that I had already done. That's why I had that trouble with the guy that tried to stop me from auditioning, because I knew I could do the play as well as anybody, or I thought I could. Right. Classic play had been done on Broadway. And, uh, Anyway, I never remembered that story about taking a swing at somebody, <laughs> but we were at a small party in Hollywood and they told my wife, I didn't, as you may know, some people, there's a lot you don't remember when you drink. Yes. I, Getting I kicked out of Spago's restaurant, the bartender <laughs> said a few months later, you want me to tell you what you did? I said, yeah. He said, he, this guy came up to me and said, you're the best actor I've ever seen. And I thought I was Lee Marvin, and I hit him. But I found out months later, he works on the Newhart show. And oh. he was an editor, and somebody said, I think you ought to apologize. But when you're drinking, yep. you be, I'm, I'm a, I couldn't hurt a flea. I'm a, already lost weight. As I might have said earlier, 5'8 and nervous, wanted to be tall and right. invincible. One of the uh, your legacy for uh, Deadwood, I think, is going to stand the test of time. And in your book, the last chapter or two, um, you talk about the closure you get from Deadwood. And when that show first stopped airing, um, I was kind of because I there's so many characters there, you want to know what happened to them, and especially your character. And so, when you did, was this the closure you needed to kind of now, I know you moved from California to Pennsylvania, but you were able to get this, this your last, this movie, in, the Deadwood movie. Uh, was this kind of like a really good way for you to kind of be like, I have closure on this part of my life? Well, it's the hardest thing to talk about. The last movie, it still won an award, but a number of people, including me, it got left on the cutting room floor. And... Uh, my wife or Minerva, I call her sometimes, says, yep. don't talk about uh, negative things. Luckily, when I was finishing the book, I was reading a script where I had some lovely scenes and uh, both poignancy and yelling and being a buffoon. And they didn't end up in the movie, but other actors did. But I got to say positive things. Boy, this is tough to talk about. Uh, the creator of the show, was ill and he was the only man I answered to for three years. Now we had six bosses and the right. six bosses can capsize the boat, but I survived it. 
and that's part of it. That's part of my claim to fame. <laughs> I've had I people that played little league ball tell people I didn't think he'd live this long. <laughs> you know, I barely. Uh, he said he said we we did a double play and he said good job Sanderson or something. He says I put my middle finger up instead of saying. <laughs> I guess he meant instead of saying thank you, I don't know. I, I've often done the wrong thing. It's called Imp of the Perverse, if anybody wants to read it uh, by, Ed, by uh, Edgar Allan Poe. It was my nickname on Deadwood. It's the Love kind that. of person who will do the wrong thing because he knows it's wrong. Right. It's a heavy duty, heavy duty short story. Now, your relationship with HBO from Deadwood to True Blood, is this something where they lock you into a, like, how does that work where a network is like, we need this guy for our show? Do you get locked into the HBO itself for these roles? Uh, if I'm understanding the question, uh, like a show so, like Justified was a great show, but I think I was on a show called Tr True Blood, which I love right. to do. After, and you're not allowed to do got you certain shows but uh not that anybody was clamoring to get me in their show but uh i loved working for hbo i loved working for david milch the creator and if i can be a politician for a minute ian mcshane as good yep. a villain as there ever was i'm not yes. answering your question molly parker good actress and all of them timothy oliphant Earl Brown. I uh, uh, was lucky to work with that cast and another great cast on True Blood, but starts with the writing and we had good writers. Now, there's a part of your book, too, where this, this, this article put out a top 10 list of your best characters. And I thought it was funny, your kind of response to it, because there's certain characters on this list where they should be on the list, they aren't. Do you ever do you have a top ten list of characters that you that you think is on your list, or are you just so proud of everything as a whole? Oh Lord, I'm not proud of everything, and I did some bottom feeders, and I loved <laughs> reading Bob Dylan. Uh, said, well, I took some jobs I shouldn't have, but he had a family and he had yep. to support them, and uh, but usually the ones they ask me about the most or the ones that they've seen stick in my memory. But Johnny Carson, with whom I did get to do a scene and work with, he said he had more disappointments than successes. I, I, I hate to confess that, that right. uh, been, re been replaced on films, been uh, cut out, been, but... I'm a lucky man to be right. here. Now, do you think those failure, I don't even want to call them failures because I think stuff happens for a reason, but do those experiences, do they inspire you or still inspire you to keep changing and being yourself and just pushing ahead? Well, there was nothing noble about what I was doing. Um, one reviewer, talk, the, the reviewers talked about uh, overcoming your childhood, your obstacles. A lot of people have rough childhoods. Santana, I read a book Santana wrote and uh, he had a really rough one. And he said, don't cry at your own movie. But right. now what am I getting off of? Uh, I forget where I was going, but another reviewer said, if you want to make an impact in life, you should wow. read the right. book. You should read the book. I didn't say that. This wonderful man named Cyrus Webb, who's going to interview me, he said, I'm going to tell Oprah Winfrey, you're one of the top 20 books, blah, blah, blah. So those things keep me going through the day. But I'm quite sure I didn't answer your question. Right. The, there was nothing. Now, I guess our good I friend. Need to keep working. Excuse me for overlapping. Sorry. No, it's. Am it's I doing good. anything wrong? No. Uh, did, did I do anything wrong? No, you're good. Uh, our friend Lori, who's a fellow of the Spirit Talk podcast, was wondering if, is it, are there ever times where you carry the baggage 
of another character into another role. Meaning, is it tough to shake a character you've created that had this impact where it, you get, like, how do you kind of reset yourself after a performance, say Blade Runner, say um, I think, Deadwood? Yeah. I think that's a great question and I don't get to talk about it much, but uh, Ian McShane says he doesn't say, shall I be honest? He, yeah. he, Ian McShane said on an interview, my friend, I don't use that word. And I don't know, it's about a 12 letter word. I find myself still saying some of the outrageous stuff I said on Deadwood. It's a vulgar word, but it's, uh, I'd love to say it because you yeah. don't get to say it often. Uh, right. and, but um, yeah, the, the, the longer you do the role, the more, uh, I didn't walk around and say, hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother, Daryl. This is my other brother, Daryl. For people old enough to remember that. Yep. But I may have worn the same clothes. or uh, I don't know. It, well, to be honest, I probably don't know who I am now. From playing right. so many roles. Uh, you might can tell that. I, I want people to like me. Uh, I guess they thought I was a pretty nice guy as a kid, but a little. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, what I've found, I mean, you've, you obviously done some other stuff, but the science fiction and the Western, if you could go back in time and live in the Western time period or go in the future like Blade Runner, which one would you pick? <sighs> Well, Blade Runner, he was a lot smarter than I am. He was a genius type. Oh, God, what and a great so, character. But uh, I'd probably be closer to Lippy and uh, who drove the wagon in the Lonesome Dove and played the piano badly. And he was the only one in the little town of Lonesome Dove that the hooker, Diane Lane, wouldn't sleep with. Yep. So, but... Uh, I liked a movie nobody ever saw because I actually had the lead with and challenge to work with Faye Dunaway. That was called Stanley's Gig. But I, uh, Deadwood was a good part. Now, the movie, well, I got cut out of the, but uh, that's not the issue. Do people like it? Did they get to see, have some satisfaction wrapping it up? And I was grateful to be a small part yeah uh, uh Deadwood was pretty good at times uh growing up my favorite superhero movie was the rocketeer and uh oh. tiny tiny ron uh you like you made this movie so like i just i whatever like the rocketeer was cool like oh he's a jetpack fly around fights on planes and blimps like cool but as I got older, I started to realize that, man, characters like yourself, Skeets, they're the reason why I like these movies. And so for me, it's fascinating to go back and, oh, Death Hunt's on TV. I'm going to watch it. Oh, I love Charles Bronson. I love E. Marvin. But the reason why I love these characters, I think, is because you make them that much better. And so, uh, again, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your military service. Thank you for putting your time and your blood, sweat, and tears into these roles because – They've had an impact on people, and uh, it's pretty cool, man. Well, I just thank you for remembering, like, even Fletch. I wanted to do a bigger role. Years earlier in New York, I was too old for that, and uh, I did this scene with, such as it was with Chevy Chase. I'm glad Fletch was good books, though, and good movies. Yes. Oh, thanks to me. But I uh, thank you again for letting me talk no, that's, vanity. that's vanity that's an exaggerated opinion ask me why i wrote the book please why did you write the book william vanity vanity no i i it's a good way to dig my own grave i wasn't doing anything else out of my wife's hair there's a lot of reasons but thank you so much so i got this book on amazon obviously everyone else can go to amazon uh you're on instagram uh, any other social media places, any websites people could find? Well, you? 
did people um, all of the big retail bar, uh, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart? They have it, but they would have to order it for you. And yep. uh, uh, we tried to keep it cheap because I thought people wouldn't. Uh, the question was, are you on any other social oh, yeah, media? Any more other what? Social media. My wife had to help me here. Just uh, Instagram. No, share right the now. best. We're on Facebook. We have a website. Yep. Help me, Sharon. Well, oh, you used to do Facebook, but that got too time consuming. Yeah, I'm I'm creeping death quick and old age here. Have you but, found uh, Have you found that first started in the industry, social media wasn't a thing, right? And so, is it tough playing catch up with that? Because right now, at my age, I was I was one of the first colleges to even have Facebook, and I'm to the point now where I hate it. I hate. I think that social media is a necessary evil, but with someone like you with your book, you almost have to kind of jump into it head first. And I think some people like myself, it's kind of, I wish there's a better way than social media. Well, I'm impressed by how good you are at the technical things. And I'm sure it came in handy in your security work, but I don't, uh, <clears throat> I just hope I outlive my enemies. That's my so barber said you had to live a long time, Sanderson. <laughs> but anyway. That's I awesome. Well, this has been a great time, William. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, once this gets ready to air, I'll send you all the links. I'll send you all the uh, artwork for it. But I uh, will dedicate the whole week to you, and uh, we'll have some fun with this. And, but anyway, this is who I am. I love it. Thank you so much, John. And uh, thank my you. brother's name. Awesome. Take care. I have my real brother and my TV brother was named John Bostad and Tony Papathus. Brother awesome. Daryl. Well, They'll kill me. Take care, man. Thank you, William, for this. Be safe. and We'll talk soon. I hope so. Thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you liked what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. <laughs>